Good evening and welcome to another weekend edition. My name is Peter Rezicek from ShadowTrader.net. Wow is all I can say. What a week it was. Continued conflict between Iran and Israel. Lots of Fed speakers pushing those rate cuts potentially even further on down the road and some earnings announcements that were not met with enough enthusiasm in the market all added up to heavy selling. Let's get into the nuances. Let's get into the charts and I'm going to show you what's really going on. Let's kick it off with an S&P Weekly just to see exactly just how bearish this week was because the expansion of range was really, really large. You can clearly see it here on the chart. It's obviously this red bar. Now, notice that the support at the end of the week, which wasn't really a support because I believe we only stopped the selling because the bell rang on Friday afternoon, but notice that it did come down to a 21 period EMA on the weekly. Now, before you go thinking this is a buy, I must tell you that this is probably not something for the market market, excuse me, to hang its hat upon because as you can see, the 21 EMA on the weekly time frame is one that gets pierced a lot. So if we're going to be looking for supports, we're probably going to be finding it on other time frames and not on this weekly. I'm also a big believer that whenever there's an expansion of range like this with a big red candle that closes near the lows, you're probably going to get a little more weakness into the next week on the next bar. We're going to get into that in a second. But while we're on this weekly chart, this can actually show us where some support might come into the market, which I think may be around 4813, just above the round number 4800 in the S&P could be a support point. And the reason I say that is because you have a breakout point here, right here in this little congestion area right here, that's the 4813 level. Notice how difficult it was for the market, especially on these weekly charts. There was about four to five weeks of congestion right there just above the 4800. The market had to do a lot of work to break out above that level. So given that the market perceives that there is value there, remember we know that value is an equation. Value is what? Time plus price or time plus volume. So how much time is spent at a certain level or how much volume is transacted at that level equals value. Where the market perceives value, it's harder for the market to drill down through it. Remember, markets want to go through levels very quickly that are voids of price action. Some people call those windows. Gaps are an excellent example, right? Whenever you have a gap, there's no support inside of the gap. So you're going to drill down through the gap or drill up through the gap, right? So this is an area of value that I'd be looking at around that 4813 next week to see if there's some support in the S&P. Let's switch over to the NASDAQ 100 for a moment, which as we know is the other major market that we pay most attention to. Remember, all of our broad market analysis on this program is going to be dealing with the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. In the case of the NASDAQ 100, obviously we've got the same large uh, expansion of range, but what I think is interesting as well, since I want to look forward and tell you where I believe that support may come into the market, there are some prior highs back here from 2022, and notice that those highs tie right in with that same Christmas of 2023 congestion area that we just talked about in the S&P. So that area is about 17, excuse me, 16, 765, and that is going to be potential support in the NDX in the weeks to come. I've now switched the chart back to the S&P and on the daily time frame. So we're actually moving down a time frame from the weeklies in order to get a little more granular and also to address some of the nuances that I spoke about last week in our first show. If you recall, I talked about the 8 and 21 moving averages in terms of how they had not yet created what I call the pinch where they were not yet moving down through. That has now happened where the 8 has actually moved down through the 21 right there and now they're stacked properly in a more bearish market where the 8 is below the 21. So that's the first thing you want to know. If there's any sort of a bounce in the market and this dynamic doesn't change, you should probably stay short and continue to be biased to that side until that dynamic changes. Now, this week has been quite bearish and all the bars, as you can see, have been red. And what's noteworthy about them as well is that it's been exactly six bars down. And I think this is noteworthy. I wanted to mention it too because we want to be looking ahead always on this program and planning for what we could do in the coming week and how we can make some money out of the market. And I say that specifically about these six days because Understand that the market tends to move in odd numbers. So the low of this will probably not happen in six days. It's usually either seven or nine. So just remember that the market generally moves in odd numbers and we've only got six. So I think there's a chance that we see some lower prices on Monday. Now, if you want to take advantage of a turnaround, a really easy strategy to use will be this. 
Look for the market to be lower on Monday, meaning taking out the RTH low. We call that RTH for regular trading hours to just differentiate it from what happens in the futures market, which is more of an overnight 24 hour market. When the cash market moves down below Friday's low, what you wanna be looking for is some sort of movement that goes down and comes back up and retests that Friday's low, especially given the fact that this will be happening on the seventh day down, which is an odd number, that could easily be a buy signal in the market. So again, remember, we'll come down again lower, mark off where that Friday's low is, and if you can come back up through that Friday's low, that may be an area where more aggressive longs and more seasoned traders may be looking to uh, establish some long positions. Before we get off the charts and wrap up this section, I just wanna play a little devil's advocate with you and look at what could potentially be the worst case scenario in the markets, because as I was saying earlier, remember, none of us can know how deep this can go, right? We don't know if the selling is going to be longer term, if it's gonna be just a flash in the pan, we may go back up next week, we may go back up the week after that, we don't know that. But it does help to have perspective on the longer term chart to see how deep it could possibly go in relation to basic trend lines. And for that, I just wanted to point out that we have been in an uptrend here from this point here, which is October of 2022, okay? Anchored to here, right, approximately October one year later, and look at where that trend line comes out. If we just sort of extrapolate out to here, we're really looking at an S&P about 4,500-ish, which is quite a plunge from where we are. We're about at 5,000 right now. We closed just under 5,000 this week, so it's quite a ways to go. Now again, I don't know if that could happen, but keep this in mind. The market could easily fall that far over the next few weeks and still be considered in an uptrend. That would not violate its trend. It would actually still be in an uptrend even if the market came down to about 4,500 in the S&P. Okay, this segment is called, Should I Do This Trade? This is actually something that I do all the time, about once a week in Weekly Options Advisory in my trading room. I do a little exercise called, Should I Do This Trade? Where I ask all the subscribers to put forth trade ideas into the room. These are options only. They're not just simplistic like buy XYZ or short XYZ. These are options plays, meaning like, should I buy a broken wing butterfly on NVIDIA? Or should I uh, you know, sell this credit spread on Apple? etc. So I invite all my subscribers to give the ideas and then we all get to learn from it together because I critique the ideas and I essentially tell them whether I should do this trade or not. So this first one comes to us from our pro trading room which looks like this, this is the room that I run every day and it comes to us from Mike187 who has a, uh, been a subscriber of mine for a while and let's just go specifically to the trade idea that Mike is suggesting right now. So Mike has suggested that he wants to sell a ratio spread. As you can see here, this is a cut and paste from the Thinkorswim platform. He's saying sell a ratio in a one three ratio, meaning uh, buying one option and selling three in Netflix for next week, which would be the April 26th expiry. And the strikes that he's looking at are on the call side, which would be 600 and 615. So just to break this down for those of you that are not familiar with this type of trade, this means that he is suggesting that we buy a 600 call and we sell three 615 calls. Now, obviously this should bring in a credit. It usually does. Sometimes it can be for even money, but this trade is specifically more for credit collection, but can also be directional, which I'll explain in a moment. And as you can see, it worked out to about a 75 cent credit. Uh, he wrote, would have to take back the entire down move and breach the 21 EMA to get into trouble. Let's take a look at the chart on Netflix and see whether or not this is actually a good idea and whether or not Mike should do this trade. Daily chart of Netflix here. First things first, notice huge gap down on Friday. Why? Because they reported on Thursday night, stock got creamed, market did not like the news. Remember, as always, it doesn't matter what the news is. It doesn't matter if they increase subscribers, decrease subscribers, what it is they're actually doing. All that matters is how the market reacts to it. And the market obviously reacted negatively. So we had a huge gap down. When the market reacts negatively, implied volatility goes up through the roof. It goes up prior to the earnings announcement, but it also stays relatively pumped during the day after the earnings announcement while the stock is actually trading. And in this trade, you can use that to your advantage. So Mike wants to basically buy a 600 call and sell 615 calls and receive a 75 cent credit. So let's just break that down as to why that 
makes sense in this case. 600 is all the way up here, way above the gap. And 615 is somewhere in here. And remember, we were just discussing value and price and time in an earlier segment in the show. We were talking about how areas of congestion in the market are not so easily chopped through. So when this idea was put forth, it was basically using the fact that that congestion is there and it would be difficult for the market to chop back up over that 615 and hence it made sense to be short at those 615 level on those calls. And remember, this is something that I call being net short because we're not just short naked, we're not short a vertical, we're not short with a short in front of our longs. We actually have a long option in front of our short option and we're still collecting a credit, which I absolutely love. So this I have to actually give a thumbs up to Mike and say this is a great trade to take. We actually took this trade live in the weekly options advisory this morning on Friday and we got between a 55 cent and a 75 cent credit I believe on the trade so we were able to collect credit and we've got directional exposure. What's going to happen if Netflix decides to turn around hard and move up hard next week? Great, we are long the 600 call and short three times at the 615. One of the things that also makes this very viable and why this is kind of a special trade just for this day is the fact that even though Netflix was down so much and we were putting it on somewhere you know, closer to the high of the session, obviously not at the lows, but one of the reasons why this works, especially in this environment, is simply the fact that volatility is elevated and especially in Netflix, because they had reported the night before, that volatility was still elevated. So even though the stock was down so much, there was plenty of credit still in the 615s. So it's a great trade to take. It collects credit, but again, it's also directional so that it can quote unquote, win both ways. These types of ratio spreads are trades that I do all the time in my trading room, weekly option advisory, and they are really successful. We have a fantastic hit rate and win rate on these trades. And oftentimes we just collect the credit or we put it on for zero. We'll put it on for even money. There's no credit or debit. That means if we're wrong on direction, we don't lose anything. And we look for what we call the expansion, meaning that the trade could go into the direction of the long strike, expand in value. And what we, for instance, paid zero for, we may be selling a week later for a 50 cent credit, dollar credit, sometimes multiple dollars worth of credit, right? So kudos to Mike187 in our room. He's gonna get a free month of the weekly options advisory because I chose his trade. And I wanna invite all of you to play as well. Obviously, this is something that I do usually once a week with all of my subscribers. But for everybody watching the weekend edition, I wanna put this out there for you as well. Next week, anytime between Wednesday and Friday, send me an email to this address right here on the screen at asktheshadow Make sure that the subject line says, should I do this trade? And in the trade, tell me exactly what options play you think you want to do for a further out expiry, usually for the next week or a couple weeks after. Usually the duration that we work with is about one week out to two weeks out. Tell me what the symbol is. Tell me what the direction is. Tell me if it's a call or put. Tell me exactly what the spread is. Are you trying to a butterfly, reverse mullet, broken wing, unbalanced, whatever the spread is, be as specific as possible. And if you you can leave a couple sentences about the little, you know, little color on the trade as to why you want to do it or why you think it makes sense. That will be helpful as well. If I choose your idea to analyze live on the air in next week's show, you will receive a free month of a weekly options advisory. All right, time now for our number one draft pick. And the number one draft pick this week is Starbucks. And I hate to say it, but it's a long. You might be thinking, why would you be looking for anything long in this market? But when we get into the chart in a moment, you'll understand exactly why I think this is going to be in play to the long side. Starbucks, monthly chart, many, many years here, 20 years. Notice the support. We've come right down. Here's our anchor. We've come right down to major trend line support after months and months of just grinding lower. Doesn't matter what the news is. The stock has fallen out of favor. Doesn't matter. Obviously, lower and lower and lower. But here's the deal. Think in terms of relative strength and relative weakness. This was one of the most bearish weeks in the market that we've seen in a while. And yet, Starbucks came down a bit, held the support absolutely perfectly. And let me switch this over to a daily chart so you can see exactly just how strong this relative strength was over the course of this extremely bearish week. 
I've switched over to a daily chart just so we can drill down and see just how amazing this relative strength was because I don't think you can see it so clearly on the monthly chart that we started with. Think in terms of what the market was doing this week. Remember, we just talked about that we came off six days down pretty hard. That means that all of the five days of this past week were all down days, and some of them were real expansions of range to the downside. And yet, what did the same time period look like in Starbucks? Look at it. Double bottom here, green candle after green candle after green candle, straight up in the face of a market that was selling off this hard. It's something I think you need to pay attention to, and it kind of puts a, a floor under the stock and makes it kind of safer, and I use big air quotes on the word safer because nothing is, of course, safe in the market. But if this is what the stock is doing in the week we just had, what should it do when the market flattens out or actually goes back up again? And it will. The market will have up days, of course. So what will happen? It's probably going to move back up to the upside. So I think that the entry is pretty obvious here. Could even be next week at the beginning of the week. Really could be anywhere within this range, which is about 87 down to about 84-ish uh, or just under 84. So you know you've got about a two to three dollar stop. I would leave that stop relatively wide. And honestly, I would be looking at a target probably in the triple digits. If you go back to the uh, go back to the weekly chart here, let me just switch back to the weekly if I could. Uh, switch back to that weekly chart that we were just looking at. Uh, actually, it was the monthly that we started on, but I'm going to take you back to the weekly. Notice this downtrend, how much open space there is here on the chart. Just this downtrend line here takes you to about 92. And if you bring this across, where there was a rel you know a high here that wasn't that long ago, you're looking at prices at about 110 to 115. So there's definitely some room to move to the upside. Uh, I believe there was some reiteration of price targets on the stock this week. I don't pay that much attention to fundamental stuff like that, but I think they were calling for $100 price target on the stock. Something to keep in mind, it's just one data point. And beyond that, nothing has changed, if you notice, with the dividend, which is solid here, 57 cents each quarter. If you do the math on that at the price that we're at now, it's paying you about 2.6% on your money just to sit in the stock. Me personally, I'm a trader. I'm not an investor. I could care less. That's not something I'm even going to think about. If I'm going to do something on this, I'm probably going to do it with options anyway, so I'm not going to be privy to that dividend. But definitely something I think you should be looking at for the longer term. The entry feels relatively safe here to me, given that relative strength. And again, you've got about a 2 to $3 risk here if you're entering long Starbucks anywhere in this time. I would put the time frame outlook of at least three to four, maybe six months, and see where we're at on the stock further uh, down into 2024. I believe if this area holds here again, we could see triple digits again, and it would be a decent gain in the name. Let's go back into the markets for a second and talk a little bit about market internals. Obviously a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Those of you who have been following me, following me for a while know that I am all about the under the hood readings of what is going on in market internals. Let's take a look over here at this chart. I used to be looking a lot at what we used to call the quad, right? If you're, those many of you who have been following us in our squawk box and in my room, you know that we used to look at something called the quad, which I've actually switched to something that I now call the sidebar. And this is a abbreviated version of it. But if you recall, just for a little refresher, the quad was basically just a screen that was divided like this into a matrix of four charts. And that had the broad market or ES futures, however you want to see their S&P or ES in one corner. Then it had uh, the breadth in one corner, which was the relationship between up volume and down volume, advancers minus decliners, the net number of that, and then also some tick readings as well. What I've done now is I've switched over to what I call the sidebar, where instead of looking at it of these four charts on a landscape monitor, you can't really see it as well here. That's why this is an abridged version. But I actually have a monitor in my setup in my office that is turned this way as a portrait. And in that portrait setup, I have the new market internals, which is the sidebar. And I thought that given that this was such a bearish week, I wanted to talk a little bit about market internals and how they should be read, because there's definitely some cross currents and some divergent information here that I think newer traders could get confused on, okay? So first things first, as I was saying how I used to read the market, these numbers here in this, these boxes here are actually the old way of looking things, meaning that they are the breadth on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, and also the advancers and decliners of both those same exchanges. And if you look here, 
this is the information from Friday. And here's what I wanted to show you about how misleading this can be in the old way that I used to look at things and how much better it is in the new way that I look at things now. Look at the breath on the Nicey. You know what kind of day we had Friday. I mean, it was hot and heavy selling and it closed relatively low. The breath is two to one positive. How does that make sense? NASDAQ, 1.13 to 1 negative, close to parity, just a hair below. Remember, this is the relationship in these two between volume flowing into up stocks and volume flowing into down stocks. So why, you ask, are these readings not much, much worse? Simple, because we had a little bit of positivity early in the session. There was actually a gap higher. Some stocks were opening much higher, and many stocks actually ended the day in the plus column because there were sectors that were actually strong on the day. Not everything was selling. So what happens is those stocks are measured in relation to their prior day's closes. If they are above their prior day's close, then they are considered an up stock and all of the volume that it's driving into those stocks goes into the positive column. And that's why you get this particular reading here. Tech was a lot weaker than other names than other sectors such as healthcare, et cetera. So you can see that weakness in the NASDAQ. And this same divergence occurs in advancers versus decliners. Look at the numbers here, 993 on the NICE. That means that 993 more stocks were advancing versus declining, again, measured against the prior day's close. And in the NASDAQ, that number was a little bit lower. It was only 123. So this is why I've switched to this new way of looking at things and I invite you to join me in it because it is really, really powerful. So I'm not really looking at these numbers as much as I used to at all and I'm certainly not looking at them in a illustrated or graphic representation like I used to. I no longer chart them. I just kind of have them there on the top of my, my, my new sidebar here and what I'm really paying more attention to now are these boxes right here which are the 11 sectors that make up the S&P. Remember, we talked about this last week in the first weekend edition, talking about how the market can only move according to the 11 sectors of the S&P, right? There is no chicken and egg conundrum of is it the futures, is it the, is it the cash market? It's always the cash market. It's the cash market itself. The 11 sectors make up the S&P. The futures follow that in the RTH session, in the overnight session, they do whatever they want. But during the day, it's all locked together. And the market is gonna move according to the weight of these 11 sectors. So notice that these 11 sectors here in these boxes, to make it different from what's up here and why this is so powerful, these are measured from the open. So as the market is unfolding over the course of the day, I know at a glance immediately where the strength and the weakness lies and how much of a chance, for lack of a better word, there is for follow through. Is the ES gonna make a clean move to the downside and keep going? Is it gonna be a little bit more choppy? These sectors were off quite a bit from their opens on Friday. Wherever the box is dark red means that that sector was down more than a half of 1% from the open. If it's just a light red, like a pink, it's less than a half of 1%. And if it's dark green, it's up more than a half of 1% from its open. One thing I do wanna point out, and this is kind of bringing you back to last week. One of the segments in our first weekend edition was called Sector Spotlight. And I don't know if you remember what the Sector Spotlight was. It was actually financials. And I said that financials actually had a chance of going up, and they did go up a decent bit this week. And look at Friday, right? We know how bad the market was down on Friday, and yet financials were up 85 basis from their open. So it wasn't really bearish across you know, across the board. There's pockets of strength here in these sectors and it's important to know, okay? Now these sectors that we use to track the market, they can be represented in a more graphic fashion here in what we call the weighted AD. This is our weighted AD indicator. We sell this on our website. I cannot recommend this enough. I think it's absolutely amazing. It is an absolute game changer. And these are the five days in question that we just had. I've kind of broken them up here with these dotted lines. And basically the way this works is it takes a graphical representation of what these 11 sectors are doing as far as their percentage change from the open and it plots them as these histograms. And if the histogram is yellow, it just means that that histogram is lower than the prior histogram, meaning that you're moving lower. If it's magenta, it's moving up. What you really wanna pay attention to as the day is unfolding is whether or not this weighted AD is positive or negative. And look at how confirming it was this entire week. Here's Monday. 
horrific. I mean, huge read down here, about minus, minus 900, relatively rare that you see that. What's Tuesday? From the open again, all negative. Wednesday, all negative. Thursday, we get a little bit of strength early. And when is it time to short the market? Bam, right there. Literally, it's time to short the market. As soon as the weighted AD goes negative, it's a huge tell. You have a signal, market goes, and market stays weak for the rest of the day. And then here we have Friday, where, look, you have a little bit of chop around here early. Why? Because... There was that little bit of a gap higher. There was a little bit of that strength. If you recall on Friday, you had a huge expansion of range in the overnight session that took markets way lower, like 80 handles lower overnight, and then rebounded and opened a little bit up, right? So that's what was happening there. There's a little bit of that push-pull. Old business versus new business, as I like to say. And then what happened? Off to the races, down, 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 with a negative close towards the end of the day. So this really tells the tale. I wanted to show you this specifically this week, especially because we're coming off this bearish week and it is a tool that I really want everybody to take advantage of. And on a bearish week like this, it definitely was confirming the relationship between all of these 11 sectors in terms of how they were acting from the open. And that's the key. Remember, look at everything from the open. That's the most important thing. And this is why I have constantly been railing against traditional financial media, which drives me crazy because they never talk about these relationships. Everything they tell you about is constantly in relation to the prior day's close. And that doesn't really mean very much. And it certainly isn't information that you can act upon. If the market is or a stock is trading on a very, very large gap, okay, and they tell you it's down 17, that is not information that you can act upon unless you are already short the stock the day before. But if you know that that same stock was actually down 35 at the open and now is only down 17, and you've, you, know, you saw it open down there and now you're moving up all that way, now there's something that's actually playable, right? You could actually be long that stock early in that session if you know what you're doing and make some of that move, right? So as you go forward, do yourself a favor, pay attention to what the 11 sectors are doing from the open. That's very, very important. Uh, if you want, you can get this particular indicator on our site. We call it the weighted AD. I think it's worth its weight in gold, and it really tells the tale in certain terms of keeping you on the right side of the market. You can really almost just look at this as like a positive negative indicator on any given day. Really, it works that well, meaning that as long as those histograms are printing negative, it's a down market. There's not going to be much upward pressure. As soon as you see them printing positive, it's changing. When it goes back to negative, boom, the bears are back uh, in control again. All right. So that's market internals for this week. For now, confirming the bearishness, and we'll see what we get next week. And that's our show for this week. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Let's just recap some of the things we were talking about. Market is definitely in the throes of some selling. I would say sellers are in control. I often speak in those terms when I'm talking to traders in my room. Sellers are either in control or buyers are in control. Sellers are in control and the market has definitely moved into a more high confidence market. This is something that we touched upon last week because it was a very low confidence market up until uh, this week where the bars were sort of lined up next to each other where you'd have one day up, one day down. That's a low confidence market. We have now moved into a more high confidence market with sellers more in control. From a technical basis, the eight period EMA has now pinched down through the 21. That is more bearish as long as it stays that way. Expect that, that the uh, market could stay under pressure. And we've got a lot of catalysts on the horizon that are affecting the market. Mainly two things. There's some conflict in the Middle East. But to be honest with you, I think that the market is more focused on the fact that it's starting to finally be more realistic about the number of rate cuts, which might be zero, honestly, in 2024 going forward. That's really kind of the, what the Fed seems to be priming the pump for. They're being very transparent, and it really feels like we're certainly not getting the amount of cuts that we expected, and whatever cuts we're getting, they seem to be pushing out further and further, and don't be surprised if we don't get any. And this is what's happening right now, is simply that the market is just rebalancing and repricing all that bullishness over the last few months when it was expecting that we were going to get five to six rate cuts in 2024, all right? If you ever want to join me and want to trade live with me every single day, hit this uh, link down here, shadowtrader.net forward slash options. Also, a great place for newer traders to start to get acclimated with what we do at Shadow Traders to go to our homepage. These are shadow shorts, which are short three-minute videos that we come out with every night. Always actionable, always salient, definitely educational, and 
put out by not only myself, but the entire Shadow Trader team, which is all the traders in our Squawk Box room. All you have to do is put your email address here on our homepage and you'll be receiving those videos every single evening. All right, that's all for this week's show from our new studio here in beautiful Los Angeles, California. I'm your host, Peter Rezicek. As always, I wish you good trading and good night.